At least one Kansas lawmaker thinks giving teachers a $500 stipend for classroom supplies will help solve the state's education problems. Plus, staffing problems for the Department of Transportation could mean your roads take longer to fix. And the governor visits with state prison guards after the state declares an emergency at El Dorado Prison. That's what we're talking about right now on Kansas Week. I'm Pilar Pedraza and this is Kansas Week. This last week started off with an emergency declaration over short staffing and overcrowding at El Dorado Prison. Thursday, the governor made a surprise visit and spoke with guards who work at the prison. Tense at times. It's one way to describe the meeting at the El Dorado Correctional Facility. Staff filled the room, some in uniform, others in civilian clothes. Their concerns mostly surrounded the long shifts they're having to work because of understaffing. There are 95 openings just at the El Dorado prison, and some of the employees are not allowed to take breaks or vacation time. Some of the staff say they're glad officials are aware of the issues and working to fix them as soon as possible. I feel a sense of confidence that I've not had in the three or four years that these problems started cropping up. A rep from the union addressed the workers too. She told them it was okay to be optimistic about all this, but to also remain cautious. Governor Laura Kelly asked them to bear with her just a little bit longer and she would do whatever it takes to make things right. And behind just about everything we're talking about today is the state budget. Here to help us get a handle on all this, I am joined by Senator Carolyn McGinn, who is chief uh, chair, I mean, <laughs> of the Senate Ways and Means Committee. And also we have Travis Mounts from the Times Sentinel Papers. Thank you so much. And just a quick note, you know that we always try to have somebody from both sides of the aisles, but sometimes somebody has to make a last minute uh, cancellation. So today we just have one lawmaker with us. But as we talk about the prison, I mean, certainly budget is something we've been talking about for a long time. I, I, I know I was speaking with you last year, or actually a couple of years ago even, about concerns of budget cuts starting to really impact some of these other areas. But it feels like the prison issue has kind of come out from behind some other issues that people were expecting and surprised a lot of folks. Well, this certainly is not something that was uh, something that just happened a few days ago or a few weeks. It's been uh, brewing for a long time. Last year, we tried to make some adjustments for the salaries for the guards, prisons, uh, to continue to keep them. Uh, but there's just been an erosion in this agency for a long time, and it certainly needs um, very much a great deal of attention. Uh, so the other thing is, is we have local government and then also federal prisons so we sometimes train some of our prison guards and then they leave for a better pay or a better pension so it's something we need to address and, um, and it, it it sounds like we are going to be addressing it well, when I spoke with uh, the interim secretary of corrections earlier this week one comment he made to me that I that just floored me is we all heard about the pay raise last year but he said, it turns out that pay raise was a negative because health costs, healthcare costs went up higher than the pay raise. So guards are actually making less now than they were a year ago as far as spending money. It's no wonder they're leaving. Well, and it's not just in that agency. We're seeing the same situation in every budget that we're looking at. When we, when we look at uh, the, the salaries of our state employees, they haven't had a raise for 10 years until two years ago. So we started making that change, um, but we're going to have to continue. And you're exactly right. Um, some of the benefits and other things that, that they have to pay into in that department are eroding the salaries. Yeah. And I, Travis, I know is we're out as journalists talking to folks, prison's not always something that's on the top of people's minds, and yet it is vital for the security of the state. Yeah, and, and this is one of those topics that I think only comes up when it starts getting media attention from folks like us, and that usually doesn't happen until there's some kind of a problem or some kind of a crisis that kicks it up above other headlines. I mean, so much of the past few years, the state budget talk has really been focused on the need to fix education, which again is a top priority. It's the biggest uh, item for the state government. Um, but as we have been you know, fighting economic challenges and trying to fix the budgets there, there are just so many other departments that, that need attention as well. Um, it, and the, the state prison system is just one of them. Yeah. And in that particular situation, though, it's the safety of our employees is, is what is most important, particularly in that agency. Yeah, I have friends uh, 
who have worked at the prison before and some that are working there now and you know they describe being in situations where it's one guard and you've got 120 prisoners and the prisoners know it's just one guard and that is not a safe situation all right, well, as you both brought up, there are other budget issues going on. Just before making that visit, Governor Laura Kelly announced she's walking back some very unpopular budget decisions at the Department of Children and Families, sending some foster care providers back to square one. Governor Laura Kelly Thursday rescinded grants awarded to the state's foster care contractors and family preservation programs. She cited a lack of transparency in the ward's process under former Governor Jeff Collier. In one case, the state gave a preservation contract to an organization that hadn't even submitted a bid. The bidding on the Family Preservation Services is already set to begin again soon. But it will take longer for bidding on foster care grants to resume. DCF's new secretary, Laura Howard, says she wants to restructure the grants to provide more stability and clarity and iron out some of the inconsistencies. The governor says this isn't necessarily about the grant recipients, but about the process. And certainly the process is a big deal when you're talking about the state house. Uh, I know you and I, Travis, are both big proponents of open government. Well, the, the lack of over open government is how you get to situations like what happened with money going to a company that didn't even bid on it. And that just looks like government at its absolute worst. It looks like, I, I mean, it looks like, you know, pay payoffs to friends or whatever you want to call it at, at the very best it looks like incompetence um, and, and shining light on government making folks see what you're doing is so important to making better decisions um, it's the people's money government officials at all levels should be open about that and you know from where we sit covering smaller towns we see that open government problem at all levels whether it's a city that just has too many executive sessions because they don't want to talk about something uncomfortable in front of other people or at the state level and decisions like this you know the, the more open we are from start to finish the better off the government and the residents of kansas are well, and certainly uh, with DCF over the last 18 months, well, a little longer than that now, but there was the interim task force on uh, child welfare and a lot of that, even lawmakers running into problems with openness from that department. Yes, and, and it's been a, a bit of a challenge in the budget committee as well. I think it's good that we're taking a look at these contracts. We have seen a lot of change in the last eight to 10 years in the foster care system. Um, my committee is actually reviewing this budget right now. We actually had hearings yesterday, and so we're trying to sort through this. Uh, this is important because we're talking about foster kids, mm -hmm. and we've had lots of problems uh, in that foster yeah. care world. Um, 75 we, kids uh, lost. Yes, yes. And, and so, you know, we have the preservation piece, and then we have the foster care. And the preservation piece is the piece that helps, comes in and helps families if a child did get in trouble or whatever, helps them figure out a way to keep them out of the system. But then sometimes you have breakdowns in families where you have to remove that child. And so this has been um, a situation that has been very frustrating for a lot of years. And so I'm glad we're reviewing these contracts. But at the same time, a lot has happened in the form of grants. And so I'm glad to see that we're reviewing these and maybe you know we need to have more contracts rather than grants. Um, so I look forward to, to seeing the direction that we're going to go. And certainly the Eagle has done a lot on the increased use of no bid contracts at the state level. And that's got to be frustrating sitting on the budget committee. Uh, legislative budget committee, it's a committee that uh, has to do with the chair, the vice chair and the, the ranking. And we meet a few times uh, in the off session. Mm -hmm. And so that, that certainly is um, something that we took a look at last summer and they have doubled in the last eight years. And so we need to get control of that. We need to have more transparency. Um, and so I, I think we'll see that change. I'm kind of seeing a, a, a corollary here between what's going on in Kansas and also kind of what we've been seeing going on nationally with perhaps the executive office taking more and more control and now the legislators saying, you know what, we need to pull back on the reins a little bit, does that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think when you look long term, you can make that narrative at both the state and federal levels and under both Republican and Democratic administrations, um, you know, at, at, at all levels. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a valid argument. 
And certainly, I mean, both the state and the federal levels built on the three check, three branches of government, the checks and balances. And sometimes things have to be rebalanced a little bit. <laughs> budget is always where it seems to come back to follow the money. The budget uh, is an interesting process. I, I feel very blessed that I have the opportunity to share that because you touch every bit of the government. So there's lots of policy that are going on in the standing committees that ultimately if they cost any kind of money at all, they're gonna go through the budget committee. And so um, we get to look at that you know, from a you know, 30,000 foot up, but we also get to look at it at a microscopic level. Yeah. Well, one of the other things that uh, we're talking about with budget is the Department of Transportation. KDOT, just one of many problems it's facing, staffing problems with 100% turnover and currently about half of all truck operator positions standing empty right now. KSN's Jasmine Haynes took a look at the problem this week. You may see these orange KDOT trucks working along the highways in Wichita. But staffing shortages across the state and the city make it hard to keep full crews. Because oftentimes we'll, we'll bring in new people, we'll train them, they uh, get a, a commercial driver's license, and then they'll go to a higher paying job. According to KDOT's website, the pay for an entry level equipment operator is $13.33 an hour, a starting wage that Tom Hines says is out of KDOT's hands. No, we don't set those rates. They're set by the Department of Administration, so we're a little bit at the mercy there of equipment operators for not only for KDOT, but across the state system. He says the high turnover rate at KDOT has become more of a challenge in the past few years. Well, I think as the economy has improved, it has become a bigger issue for us because there are more jobs out there. There are higher paying jobs that people can go to. The crew shortages are especially felt during snow and icy weather. You know, at times we don't have all the snow plows out that we could have out if we had full crews. Hines says they are hiring. Wichita has 14 equipment operator trainee positions open. In South Central Kansas, there's 33. So if someone is looking to become an equipment operator, we will train you. And this is something that is just part, a small part, as you said, of a 30,000 foot problem <laughs> with transportation. There have been various cuts made as the legislature has euphemistically dipped into the bank of KDOT over the last several years. What's it looking like right now? Well, first off, I just want to say how much we appreciate whether you're a prison guard working long hours or whether you're working for KDOT and you're going out in these miserable weathers and having to, to, to work those long hours to make sure that things are safe for us. Um, it's certainly appreciated. But part of this problem with NKDOT has to do with Again, I go back to we had 10 years that state employees did not get a raise because we were so strapped for finances. And so we need, we're need we starting to repair that. But also, in addition to that, is KDOT has been strapped because we have funding that is supposed to go to the, those, those highway programs and it's not getting there because it's the sales tax that's been used to fill the other potholes, no pun intended, <laughs> in the budget. And so we've got to quit doing that. I know the governor said that she wants to try to stop that and, and make some changes. I know we have a lot of uh, legislators that would like to see uh, KDOT funded more, and that could take care of some of these issues that, as far as um, our pay for our employees as well. Well, and Travis, you're saying you've seen some of these similar issues at the city level too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of the cities that, that we deal with have faced a similar problem with their police departments. You know, you hire somebody on knowing that you aren't able to compete with larger uh, cities, with uh, county sheriff's departments, or, or with uh, highway patrol. And uh, so they hire somebody on, they pay for their training, and then they take the next available job. Well, what a number of our cities have done have, they basically put in a requirement, you know, one or two years that you need to stay or you end up repaying the cost of your training. And so that gives them a little bit more stability. It provides an incentive for the new officer to stay there for a while and, you know, through their time, pay back for their training. You know, that's one thing that, that KDOT mm -hmm. could possibly look at. But like so many things, money fixes a lot of problems. You know, uh, a, a couple more dollars an hour and you might have some of these people still there. Yeah. Well, and a big question is, where does that money come from? I and mean, that's really something that uh, the state's been struggling with. We have a dedicated portion of the sales tax that is supposed to go to that. There is also a gas tax. 
We also uh, just, I just turned in about seven or eight bills on the tra the, uh, that have to do with the Transportation Task Force recommendations. So we'll be working on that as well. And so I think people will get to see, one, the deterioration that have happened to our roads. And not only that, in the KDOT um, agency as well, it's not just those folks that go out and keep our roads clean and safe. It's also, we've lost engineers, and we're going to need those engineers if we're going to do the next 10-year plan uh, for our roads here in Kansas. And that's certainly something that's very, I mean, that's right on the horizon, trying to figure out what the state's going to do over the next 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and again, it's, you, we're going to have to make some priorities, and, but we're still going to have to be, we have a little bit of money, and people need to not just spend it like we have a lot. We have to be very conservative because even if we invest in some of these areas, that, such as the prisons or the roads, we have to look at the two or three years out and make sure we don't get into a declining situation again. Yeah. And we're, we're still just trying to dig out of a hole in so many situations too, and that just makes it that much harder. Yeah. Well, I'm talking about trying to dig out of a hole with that. We've got a court order deadline looming over state lawmakers as they try to figure out how to put more money into public schools. But will they be in time? Schools are facing a deadline of their own, and the uncertainty is creating problems for them already, as I discovered in this report for Cake News. A penny's worth one, six, a nickel's worth five. In this second grade class at Valley Center's Wheatland Elementary, the students are learning how to count their dimes, nickels, and pennies. Up the road, district administrators are practicing the same skill as they try to figure out next year's budget. Our planning for next year begins about December. Just to start with staffing and whether incurred costs, we know there's some other rising costs we need to plan for. Um, so it's not that we wait until June, July. It is, it is already started. Superintendent Dr. Corey Gibson says when it comes to lining up next year's teachers, the district has already put some hiring decisions on hold. We've already posted some, and then there's a whole other layer we're just waiting to see what legislators do. Despite the district's need to know what to expect next year, Gibson says it's difficult to follow all the different proposals lawmakers are putting on the table. To date, there are at least six distinct bills with six different funding formulas and totals. It is nearly impossible to keep track of each one of those individual ideas at this stage. Lawmakers have to send a school funding bill to the governor by early April if they're going to make the state Supreme Court's deadline. With a more divided Kansas House, there are those who predict lawmakers won't make that deadline, leaving one more fear hanging over school districts. And so once again, we feel in that, that crossroads of what happens if legislators don't comply by that date. Um, and of course, worst case scenario, it means schools don't open at the right time. And that is a huge concern, and it should be for everybody in Kansas. And uh, it certainly feels like we've done the story over and over again. I know you and I have had this conversation over and over again. I think the biggest question people have is, are lawmakers going to make that uh, that Supreme Court deadline? Because usually they wait until the April 20 consensus revenue estimate before even really starting. And now they've got to get it turned in before that even comes out. Well, first off, I think we need to clarify what's happened and uh, as part of the confusion. The, there was a Senate bill that was introduced, Senate Bill 44, and it is the governor's two-year bill on schools. And she put everything from what we addressed last year and the, what the courts are looking at us to look at on the inflationary thing. So that was all in one bill. And so that went to the special committee on school finance. And so they were having hearings on 53% of our budget. <laughs> and so I had talked to our president about that and the, the committee on the school finance really wanted to just deal with the inflationary piece. We split that bill up and we ended up refile, we put uh, the K-12 regular budget, everything that we did that's in current law is now in the Ways and Means Committee in the K-12 subcommittee. So that is where that is and that is where that belongs. The piece that has to do with the final piece of litigation is in the school um, finance committee. That is Senate Bill 144 now. The K-12 regular budget is Senate Bill 147, and that is in the Ways and Means Committee. So I think when you talk about schools wondering about whether to hire teachers or not, we're not talking about the bulk of their budget anymore. That is already there. We're talking about the inflationary piece. Well, and really, when I was talking with uh, Dr. Gibson from Valley Center Schools, he was talking about, you know, we're a growing district. 
And these are the things we know we absolutely have to do. So we've put those out there. These are the ones that it kind of depends on how much the state gives us, you know, whether we decide to have uh, classes of 25 or 28 or 30 max, um, that sort of thing. And I'm just pulling numbers as far as classroom sizes, but it, it, those kind of decisions which would determine, and so those are the kind of things that they're putting off waiting to find out how much more they might get because those are exactly the kind of things that schools are putting that extra money that they got last time into is more teachers, more classroom, that sort of stuff. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and there, there's always an inherent challenge in the schedules in that mm -hmm. the the legislature just by the nature of its schedule is wrapping up, you know, at or after when school districts want to be doing theirs. I don't know how you fix that. That that's, you know, that involves changing somebody's, you know, schedule at the DNA level. And and yeah. so even <laughs> in the best of times you know, there's some uncertainty on things frequently going into the school budget time. Well, and that also would involve bringing the federal government into it too, because that's a big part of why schools have to do things when they do. But, but keep in mind also, the governor went back to a one-year budget for all the other agencies, and she kept a two-year budget for schools. Mm -hmm. And that way we're always one year ahead with the exception of the, the lawsuit. Yeah. The other piece though I would like to share as they're trying to plan those classrooms has to do with the, a piece of legislation that happened last year that put the cap on the bonding and I'm hearing from a lot of my school districts um, that that is going it you know they're all having to get in line in mm -hmm. order to do their bond the problem is we have a school Mays high school that tells me you know in the next few years we're gonna have to build two new high schools yeah. and if they are not in line they're, mm -hmm. they're gonna be strapped. Yeah. They're having to I've had a couple of those conversations with superintendents as well where they're having to make those decisions way ahead of time rather than waiting and seeing what circumstances say we really need. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and certainly that uncertainty after years and years is starting to weigh on the education system, on the administrators and on the teachers as well. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it just gets tough when you're dealing with those same challenges year after year. It, it is, does get tiring. Yeah. Well, there is one plan out there that one law, at least one lawmaker came up with. It's a from a committee, so I don't know how many lawmakers are behind it, but at least one proposal wants to push more money directly into classrooms by handing over a $500 stipend to each teacher for classroom supplies. But the teachers I spoke with had a few problems with the idea, as they explained in this story I filed with Cake News. This second grade math class is learning how to tell the difference among pennies, nickels, and dimes. Okay, you're gonna put your pennies all in this pile. The toy money they're using? Teachers call it a classroom supply. Books, pencils, games, flexible seating, um, the list goes on and on. Art supplies, seasonal things. But House Bill 2233 defines classroom supplies as only consumable items, supplies students would use up by the end of the year. The Valley Center superintendent says his district already takes care of stuff like that, as do most other districts. Consumables, whether that be paint or, or whatever might have you, uh, or even just regular instructional supplies, we allocate equivalent to $3,000 per classroom. Per year. He says this bill comes down to one of two things, either an unfunded mandate that would cost the district an extra $90,000 a year, it would have to be cut from someplace else, or more paperwork recording what the district is already doing. If that's just money that we were going to get anyhow, then it's not going to help. It's actually going to create more of a problem if there's more paperwork. And then there's a concern about that word stipend. That appears to me that the, the funding would actually go directly to the teacher the teacher would make the purchase, give the receipt back to prove that they spent the $500 a year. Meaning teachers would have to pay taxes and make contributions to their pension fund out of it, leaving them with less money than they're getting now. Now we have 300. How many do I need to take away? One. One. The second grade math teacher Jamie Burbach says in that case, she'd rather have something like the tax credit teachers used to get from the federal government. I think in a lot of respects the tax credit is easier because you're not having to keep track of every individual itemized thing that you buy. Now it's kind of unusual to have a bill that says we're going to give teachers more money or we're going to give teachers money and then to say you know what I don't know that this would necessarily work for us. But this bill is set for a committee hearing on Monday. So it, this isn't just a bill that somebody threw out there and it's not going to go anywhere. It, 
they're going to hear from folks what they think about it. How often do we run into bills like this? Oh, a lot. <laughs> um, and so, you know, a lot of times I'll have, bills will be introduced in a different chamber or a different committee and I'll have constituents calling all alarmed. And, and if I'm not on that committee, I generally just share, you know, if, if it doesn't get out of committee, you know, I'm not going to put a whole lot of attention to that. You know, it needs to get out of committee. It's got to go through the scrutiny on the floor and then back and forth on the chamber. This appears to be, I don't know the motivation for sure behind it. I mean, I can think about what it might be, but it seems to be an accounting nightmare. And I think that it would be simpler instead of having schools have to do all this paperwork and documentation is that if, if we have to make an adjustment to their base, that might be a simpler way to go rather than having um, teachers to have to figure out their purchases, turn them in, and then being reimbursed. Um, so again, it'll be interesting to hear what's uh, shared at the uh, hearing. I have a feeling it's going to be a lot of what we heard from those teachers. I mean, really, the thing they kept saying over and over and over again is, no more paperwork, please. I mean, I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure you hear the same thing. Well, and, and again, if you end up having to pay taxes on it, suddenly it, it doesn't feel like as much of a benefit. Um, it, it does seem like the simpler solution would just be to put some more money into the schools and let them make the best decisions at the local level. What is best for that district, for that school, for that teacher's room? And, and let the experts at the local level decide. Okay. Well, we've got a few more weeks, about six more weeks left in the set regular session. What do you think are going to be the big topics this next week? Well, so we're getting close to the turnaround mm -hmm. date, and so all the bills, there are a lot of bills that got introduced this week. We'll see whether committees can get through them or not. Um, so, you know, one, again, the transportation bill, that'll probably come sometime uh, in March. But we, generally the first part has to do with just individual legislators' priorities and those types of things. And so we've already, um, the Senate has already voted to make the CAPERS payment that we didn't make in 2016. We've already voted on a tax bill. Um, I don't know what the House is going to do. I know people want to see sales tax lowered on food. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a priority of mine. That's a bill that we're going to hear in tax committee on Thursday. But at the same time, it's not going to be until a little bit later when everybody kind of sees where the chess pieces are that they start putting those things together to figure out where we're at. All right. Well, Carolyn, Travis, thank you guys so much. I appreciate your input and I've enjoyed our conversation. I hope you've, we've answered some of your questions about what's going on at the State House. If you would like to know more about these topics, feel free to reach out to us on Facebook or Twitter. Just look for KPTS Channel 8 or Pilar Pedraza TV. For now, have a great week.